happen. That sounds better. Um, <laughs> even I can hear it now. That's great. Um, did you hear the? Did you hear Noni's <laughs> intro? I no. Okay, I'm going to no. rehash oh, it's that right, quickly. It's all right. You know, when I show my slides, I'll. It'll do okay. Noni <laughs> Little Pena, but a major maker in this space, someone who's really defining it. Um, geez, someone should have raised their hand. And sorry, I should have should have checked. Uh, Rainy Aronson, Frontline, the the woman who makes it all happen there, and the person who's been really redefining their whole remit, uh, bringing it into the digital age, moving it across platforms, across publics and across organizations. And she's also a fellow, has been a fellow at uh, our Open Doc Lab here at MIT. Um, next to Rainey is Casper Zonin, um, someone I've known for a real long time. Casper uh, uh, is, is, a, is a festival organizer and curator, and he founded the Doc Lab at IDFA, International Documentary Festival, uh, Amsterdam. And this really is the place, the cauldron, the, the, the place that's defined more than any anywhere else that I know of, the, the whole genre, I guess, of interactive and immersive documentary. So Casper is someone who's really always looking for the ways in which new technologies meet uh, the documentary form. And I have to say, November, each November is a treat to just see what wild and wonderful things Casper comes up with. Um, so he knows the field unlike anyone else that I know, and um, he's also pretty energetic. In addition to the doc, Info Doc Lab, he is also one of the co-founders of Photo Stories and also the Open Air Film Festival in Amsterdam. So someone who's a curator to the bone. Um, and finally next to me, Katie Morrison, co-founder and producer at Vertov, which is a VR studio, uh, maker of, among other things, Ascent, uh, the turning force. So one of the, one of the real big innovators in this space, uh, flown all the way over from Australia, still Still Probably awake. lunchtime over there, huh? <laughs> or is it midnight? Um, and a woman who's really um, done a lot to bridge the gap between traditional documentary makers, linear documentary makers, because she was one, and the world of VR uh, documentation. So someone who really understands the different affordances of each side, the different manners of engagement, the different kinds of immersion and affect that both media are capable of, and who's really done a terrific job at translating one community to the other through her work as much as anything else. So what I thought we'd do tonight is start with, um, that's a lot of words and they sound great, but these are people who make stuff. Um, so I thought I, each of them could give a very short presentation about their work. Uh, we'll start off with Noni, and then following that, have a few questions up here, but please, this is really for you. This is an immersive, interactive medium, so uh, par excellence here, so you guys can think of your questions. We have mics, and after a few rounds of questions, after a warm-up up here, we'll turn it over to you. So, Noni. Yeah, hi. Uh, you guys can hear me, right? Just a quick, I have to shout out to Bester Cram, who's in the audience here tonight, who has worked with me on many of my documentary films and taught me so much about documentary filmmaking that I was able to bring into the virtual space. So it's really an honor, not only for the MIT, but also to somebody who was one of my great mentors is in the audience. So the first piece, one of the first earliest walk around virtual reality pieces I ever did was called Hunger in Los Angeles. I was working as a research fellow at the University of Southern California's journalism school. And they were doing a kind of what I consider a traditional piece now uh, with photos and video and audio all up on the web. And I asked the students in the class, you know, I really want to make this VR piece. Anybody want to do it? So um, knowing this was published in uh, March of 2010, by the way, so um, this was many months before this. And um, nobody had raised their hand. I think they all thought I was nuts. So actually, I found another intern from another place, a, a high school student who was graduating. And um, with my own money, uh, about 700 bucks, um, we went out and started recording audio at food banks across Los Angeles. Um, until one day she was at this long line and a man with diabetes who was standing there didn't get food in time and he collapsed into a diabetic coma. And she came back and she played me the audio. I was like, oh my God, that's what we have to build with. But again, we had no resources. <clears throat> so with virtual humans that were donated, as you can see in this slide, we rebuilt the street to the best of our abilities. And in fact, the Photoshop of the street, you can see the kind of the gum and stuff on the street. You could have gone and found that actually on the street that day. Um, and here's a little video um, using that real audio uh, of the walk around experience that we made. There's too many people. There's too many okay. people. Okay. Right, somebody just. Okay, he's having a seizure. Okay. 
So you can see the guy on the right, you know, he's wearing the crazy goggles we were using in the lab at USC. And for him, he feels like he's in the room with that guy, right? Even though the graphics aren't perfect, whatever, he's very careful not to step on the seizure victim. He's looking down at him, he's walking around, he's looking at people talking on the mobile phone, right? So that piece gets into Sundance for January of 2012. This is fall of 2011 now, which took quite a while for me to get my C-sharp coding up and become a better Unity programmer and beg and borrow a lot of favors to get it made. Gets into Sundance, but there's a problem. The only goggles we have are called the Wide Five, and they're $50,000 a pair. <laughs> and, the, and the head of the lab's like, you're not taking those anywhere, right? So what are we gonna do? So there was this funny little team of people hanging out, and we started making goggles. This one kid had already been making some goggles in his garage. That's the one who's got his face planted in that mask there. And if you kind of look at the screen, if you look at those little two black dots, those are your eyes, and we're trying to figure out where to put what's called the IPD, where the eyes should go, blah, blah, blah. And a great guy in the back, Ty Fan, who's really unsung. Anyway, we show up at Sundance with something that looks like this, duct tape <laughs> goggles, right? And I really don't know how people are gonna behave. And this is opening night, right? Wow. The festival. Oops, sorry. So what'd you think? Oh, you're crying. You're crying. Gina, you're crying. I'm completely shocked, right? But this happens over and over again. People trying to touch the seizure victim, trying to speak to him, take care of him. And just as another little quick look at those goggles, because it's kind of a historical moment now. Uh, you'll see in the bottom, it's signed Palmer Lucky, who William mentioned. Um, nine months later, at this point, it's Sundance. He's like crashed in my hotel room and driving the truck back and was like kind of the intern of the project. Nine months later, he starts the Oculus Rift. And two and a half years later, he sells it for two, uh, $2 billion to Facebook, okay? Ends up on Time Magazine and gives us the most memed Time Magazine there ever was in history. <laughs> So in the same time in that lab, there were these guys who were making what were, were called the FOVs to go. Um, and, this, uh, and I, they were fold up viewers for mobile phones, right? Um, so again, this is back in 2012. So this is me in, in April of 2012 at, at Facebook at an event called Tech Wrecking for journalists that was run by uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting and Google. And I'm handing these things out and saying, really, really, they're future. You can kind of tell from my beady eyed look. I swear it's the future. but. Um, then this fall, of course, we get the Google Cardboard delivered in millions to people. You know, this would showed up at my house. Crazy, crazy. This is four years later, you guys. Like nothing, right, time-wise. So four years, what's happened? So now I'm gonna give you just five little predictions, I think, for the future, and then I'll move off stage. I think that kinematic virtual reality, in which you walk around, will become the new cinematic. I think it will become the most commonplace thing all the new headsets coming out, the Vive, the Sony Morpheus, Oculus, they let you walk around. And even things like Cardboard and Gear VR are gonna have controllers that are gonna let you move around. And the Oculus VR guru, the guy who helped start Oculus, John Carmack, thinks that positional tracking is gonna be just as important for mobile VR. So that's one thing. Two, scan environments. They're gonna be uh, really important, how we're gonna do them, and supplemented by Google Maps. Instead of you, uh, looking at a flat view or even Google Earth view, you're just going to be walking down that street you want to see, literally with your goggles on. So how does this sort of thing apply? When we did Project Syria, um, uh, let me give you a little sample of what that was about. that we had to reconstruct the street in like a Bible and then have to make it physically, right, in the virtual world. So having spaces that we can actually just be made for us and we go, oh, it happened there and it's already done for us in Google Maps and then we just put the activity in, you know, the action, that's gonna help all of us documentarians and journalists be able to tell our stories in a volumetric, uh, kinematic way. I'm gonna skip this slide, because I'm a little behind, I'm sorry. Uh, witness and characters will be scanned readily um, in this story where a guy was beaten and tasted to death by the uh, Border Patrol, um, this grainy footage that, that helped uh, 
Find what really happened. Uh, this man was 16 over a dozen patrol officers, beaten and tased him to death. We took the witness who hid some of the footage in her pocket, and we brought her in and we scanned her, right, in order to make uh, a full look like of her in the scene. And then we put a motion capture suit on her, so she reenacted her own memories of the night uh, instead of us asking her questions. Well, everybody's phone is going to allow them to scan people now. Qualcomm, Intel. All those chips are coming this summer that you're going to be able to just walk around somebody and in three minutes have a scanned version of them. Of course, then you have to animate them, which at this point is still a little bit harder. And you'll be able to scan environments, too, wherever you are. On the right up there is Project Tango, which is a big Google project to let you scan things. Right now, this is the kind of thing that we have to do when we do a facial capture onto a, uh, an animated model. Um, this is from a piece we did on what happens to young women when they try to go into health clinics like Planned Parenthood. You're this a is whore. real audio. You're a whore. You're a whore. You're a little whore. How about stop being a whore? You whore, shame on you. Start closing your legs. Start having some respect for your body. Maybe your parents should have aborted you. So that was a, a, like a facial capture of somebody actually trying to face, uh, to recreate the, the audio for us. Um, number four, how are we going to stop doing that while we're trying to replace uh, the, the animation? We'll do something called videogrammetry. High fidelity volumetric capture in video will we'll rule the space. We just captured a guy who is part of a community of um, kids who were from the LBGTQ community who were thrown out by their families. And if you look in that green, hidden in that green uh, screen area, are those little black cameras. There's multiples of them, I think it's like 46. And they capture in video from every angle so you can actually walk around video. I know that's sort of hard to conceive of what that's like, but that is, uh, Ada is a company we're starting to partner with, and uh, in our partnership with Frontline, we've already begun um, a project together using exactly this technique. And finally, my last slide, um, uh, the future. I think that uh, after the HoloLens, where we're being projected into each other's rooms, um, we're actually gonna occupy bodies in two places at once. Do you hear me now, video Nani? Where we were playing with that. Nice to meet you, Mola Gust. Welcome to Barcelona, Benvinguda Barcelona. I don't know, Noni, if I could ask you to raise your arms. A ver si pot aixecar els braços. Ja veieu que els aixeca. Keep them up, because now we'll show the robot. I ara anirem a veure el robot, que ja veieu. Can you move them a little bit more? A veure si els pot moure una mica més. Up and down. Doncs ja veieu que el robot reacciona perfectament amb la Noni. Noni, I'm ready to interview you now for, for a few minutes. Li farem una entrevista a la Noni per veure què li ha semblat aquesta experiència. You're a journalist, ella és una periodista, i fa una estona entrevistat un científic de Barcelona. You just interviewed a, a researcher from Barcelona, but in a, in a body of a robot. What was that experience like? So, for me, it starts to feel very natural after a while. Uh, occasionally, there's some problems with the, the, the eye movement but beyond that, very quickly, I'm in there in Barcelona with you. The next time I come to speak at MIT, I'll be here without being here. Thank you very much. Stand away from the mic. Hi. Is that better? So I'm Rainy Aronson, as William said, from Frontline. And um, how many of you guys watch Frontline documentaries, the linear form? OK, that's a large number. Do you guys, are you aware that we're doing work in 360 and VR? Some of you. Well, that's understandable. So we are new um, to the world of VR. And I would say that um, 
Partnering with Nani has been really extraordinary for us because we're moving from um, cinematic VR, which is what we've just been trying to figure out what the right words are for what we're making right now, to volumetric VR. And one of the things that Nani and I, Frontline and Emblematic, are really tasked with is looking at some of the journalism ethical questions that arise um, when we're creating new filmmaking tools, especially when you're going into a frameless space like we do with VR. And we can talk about that if you're curious. The other thing for Frontline has been that over the last couple of years, we have been exploring all sorts of new visual storytelling tools. And I think the reason for that is that we're naturally visual storytellers through and through inside our shop. So for us to look at the new space that people were creating in, to be honest, VR was the best and sort of closest kindred spirit for me, as a filmmaker, I understood it, and I want to explain that because, of course, William and Sarah Willison were kind enough to um, ask me, and I begged them, frankly, to become a fellow a couple of years ago in the Open Doc Lab, and I can remember the very early days not understanding, I don't know, Sarah, maybe 75% of what you guys were talking about because I'm a linear filmmaker. But once we started to talk about VR, I started to really understand it, and I decided that was really what we should explore. So we look at VR as filmmakers, as visual storytellers, and importantly, as journalists. And I am convinced over the last number of months in particular as the technology becomes more accessible and the barriers to entry become lower. And that's really important to me because I'm in public media and I believe that media should be affordable. I believe people should be able to experience this without having the entry point be too expensive. I do believe that this will radicalize and change storytelling in the world that I live in, which is the world of journalism and journalistic documentary. So I I wanted to show you a clip from something that we've done out of the South Sudan. It's simply just wonderful to look at, and we can talk a lot more as well, and I want to give my colleagues time. So I'll show you this, and I'll sit down, and we're here for questions. take to fix a film. I think we changed the um the displays. There you go. No. Then we go into displays. That's hysterical. There's five of them. Over to him. There you go. I'm going to sit down too. You might want things. This plane is taking food to remote villages in South Sudan's lowland swamps. It's the rainy season, and roads are washed out. The only way to get food here is to drop it from the sky.
Can you hear me, guys? Is my microphone on? Yeah, OK, cool. Um, so thank you for the invitation. And it's a real privilege to be here in Boston. As, as, uh, as William said, I've just come from Australia. So <laughs> please forgive me if I like doze off or say something very um, <laughs> unusual during the course of this evening. Um, it's a long flight. Um, so basically, I'm going to take you through a little bit about who we are and what we do. I run an independent production studio called Vertov with um, Oscar Raby, who is in the audience here. He's the creative director, and I'm the producer. Um, we are a very small, independent studio um, that comes from that kind of tradition of, of being an indie. And when I say small, there's like two of us normally. There's 12 of us at the moment, but you know we kind of range in, in that very kind of small space. Um, we uh, started... Vertov in about, well, I, I would say we started it in 2013 off the back of um, this project here, which was um, Ascent, which was made primarily, well, it started off as a, um, a master's project that Oscar was making as, an, um, a, as a master's in interactive media. And um, it is, was finished its first version in 2013 and went on to kind of have a premiere in 2014 and took us a lot of places. Um, it went to Sundance in 2015 and it's kind of still continuing to have a life. It is actually here at the exhibition um, over the next couple of days for you guys to see. Um, Ascent is an autobiographical documentary about Oscar's family and an event that his father witnessed in 1973 while he was an officer in the, um, the Chilean military, um, which at that time was a dictatorship. Um, so it is a really personal story. Um, it's made as a interactive, real-time VR documentary, which is the way that we work, um, in, in, um, in contrast to some of the other people here today. Um, and I think when we first started to kind of think about how we were going to do VR, we never really had a conversation about you know, all the different, the different options that we had available to us and, and we chose interactive real time for any particular reason. But in kind of in doing these presentations and thinking about the, our trajectories towards this, this position, um, I think it actually makes a lot of sense that we have ended up in the place that we're in. And I just kind of want to take you through a little bit of that thinking because I think it's as important as the technical kind of side of it. Um, Oscar is a visual artist by training and I, um, as William said, am a documentary Maker. I worked for a long time in TV. Um, but before I did that, I was actually training to be a historian because I thought, yeah, you know, I'm going to make myself a lot of money. <laughs> I'll be a historian. And then I decided documentary was more lucrative. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, uh, while I was studying history and I did um, my undergraduate degrees in history and I did a postgraduate in history as well, um, I was really interested in historiography and um, the ideas about. Um, how we ascribe meaning to events. So I was less interested in, you know, a very kind of, um, a very sort of um, fact-based approach to history as a more kind of interpretive approach. And I think thinking about the way that we work now, that makes a lot of sense to me that we've ended up in an interactive format and, and doing real-time VR because um, we've both been very interested in the kind of the space between um, the user of a text and the text itself and that kind of relationship. So our approach to VR um, is in interactive real time, and um, it's also what we're starting to call operational documentary. So we're interested in the operations that the user makes that um, that tell the story as much as what happens in front of their eyes or are all around them in the, in the case of VR. So I'll show you a little trailer from um, Ascent, but as I say, it is here at the, um, at the exhibition. So... Hi, Dad. I'm glad you could see this. I thought the instructions might have been a bit confusing, but here you are, so I guess it worked. I wanted to send you something real, and oddly enough, look what I came up with. Look around. If you stare at certain things for long enough, something happens. We're looking back to 1973. Right on this spot, you have just been notified of a court martial taking place up the hill. 
But today, I want you to take the time you didn't take back then and stay with me for a little longer. Ascent, um, we went on to, um, to make our next project, which has just been at Tribeca. Um, it isn't actually a documentary, so I'll just quickly show you a slide from it to show you what it is. Um, it's a fiction a fairy tale, um, which was an interesting project that, again, allowed us to work in interactive real-time VR. Um, and this project was actually a research project together with the BBC Research and Development Department um, based on um, their experiments in binaural audio, so our kind of main um, investigation in this in this particular project was how to turn um, that interest in audio into an interactive mechanic that we were able to bring into the experience. So we ended up um, creating this quite beautiful fairy tale um, that um, where the main user interaction is in kind of triggering the soundscape. Um, we are. Coming back to the documentary space now, we have a project which is launching at Sheffield in June, um, which is a great project, which is a documentary about um, the Easter uprising in Ireland um, with BBC I Wonder, uh, again, working with a broadcaster, which is, I think, something that we should touch on a little bit later on, how, how it is for an indie VR company to work with a big broadcaster kind of finding their feet in themselves in VR. Um, this project kind of comes back to the sort of the, the structure that we set out in the in a way. It's based on an audio recording of a man who was involved in the uprising um, in 1916. He recorded his memories in, um, when he was about 70 years old and put them on a cassette tape, put them away in a drawer and um, forgot about them. And his descendants found that tape a little bit later on and, um, and it came to us in the end. Um, and that kind of formed the backbone of the interactive, of the experience. Um, so our job was then to try and tease out what, um, what are the operations that we can kind of put into this experience that really kind of convey the story of this guy. Um, so we took that recording and used it to kind of craft this experience where you inhabit his memories of, of that time. Um, and here's another slide from that one, talking about the things he did and, and things that he perhaps didn't do. Um, just quickly, a little note on how we work. Um, so this is, we work with um, a lot of 3D scanning for our documentaries. The fairy tale project was crafted entirely in, um, you know, from scratch in, in 3D, but our documentary projects, um, we use a lot of 3D scanning. This is a still from the, a production process of Ascent, which back in 2013 we were using just Microsoft Connects to scan with. Um, so that's, that's where that started. Um, this is a production still from the Irish project where you can see Oscar using, um, it's, we use consumer technology, we use an iPad with a, an attached 3D sensor. So, you know, that turned into, that's one of the, the finished pieces. So we take those 3D scans and bring them into um, a game engine um, and it ends up looking like that. Um, it's quite portable technology. This is one that was made in South Sudan. So um, I was gonna show you a bit about the workshops that we also run, but I think I will leave it there and we can kind of come back to that if we have time in the conversation. Um, so, first of all, it's an honor to be here um, next to uh, uh, the person who introduced me to Ziga Vertov and <laughs> Sarah Walzen up there, uh, who introduced me to my favorite robot artist, uh, who was actually from MIT. Um, my name is Kasper, as uh, said, and I work at ITFA. Uh, how many of you know ITFA? Wow. Um, so it is an international documentary film festival, after all. Um, it was founded uh, 29 years ago uh, by Ali Dirks, um, and in 2007, um, I started a program there called ITFA Doc Lab, 
uh, sort of to explore uh, documentary storytelling in the age of the interface. Um, and when we started, um, this was, I guess, some of the buzzwords that were uh, around at that time. Uh, web documentary, a lot of transmedia words that we, some of us really would like to forget at this point. Um, and we'll probably have the same with some of the words that we're talking about today uh, around VR, maybe in the future. Uh, in the end, what we decided uh, back then to focus on, uh, because we couldn't find a word that actually made sense, uh, so we decided to focus on four main ingredients. Um, first of all, story, interface, digital data and technology, and as we are a documentary festival, captured reality in uh, whatever form possible. The only thing we didn't focus on was linear filmmaking, basically. Um, to give you a little uh, hands-on of what type of projects that we uh, look for at the festival, uh, I think she's here somewhere, Kat Sizak, uh, one of the, I would say, godmothers of interactive documentary. Um, the High Rise Project, um, so interactive documentaries, web series, but also data art like We Feel Fine, uh, made by Seth Kamvar uh, from MIT, together with Jonathan Harris. Uh, multimedia journalism, um, digital performance art, which I think is not a term used a lot, but I think if we look at early works of people like Zay Frank and Miranda July, that's basically what it is. And I think in 2011 or 10, we had our first uh, VR project. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this one tomorrow uh, at the conference. Uh, but I just want to show you one clip um, of uh, a project by Alexander Rieben, a project that we commissioned. Uh, in, I think, 2012 or 13, uh, as an example of, I would say, sort of some of the other less web-based projects, uh, but projects that involve robots, AI, biometric uh, technology, etc. Um, leave the lights on, it's on. I'm going to ask you some questions. in the world my mom I love my mom my wife <laughs> what will people remember you for uh, a little bit crazy freaky generous small tell me something that you've never told a stranger before so we're not gonna play that game now but um... <laughs> Uh, we'll go on to what do we do with these projects. Um, so we look for them, we curate them, we select them, and occasionally commission them. Um, but then we're basically still a festival. So t every 10 days, or ev for 10 days every November, um, we have a competition program in the main festival um, where we actually now have two awards, a digital storytelling one and an immersive nonfiction award, Hey VR. Um, we organize a 10-day exhibition uh, with installations. This is uh, a Machine to Be Another from Be Another Lab. Um, we organize live cinema events, which back in 2008 started as sort of director's navigations, where um, a director would navigate through an interactive program creating sort of a live linear version. Um, nowadays, wow, that's bad resolution, sorry. Uh, now we're exploring much more sort of theatrical and new types of live cinema events, uh, ranging from collective VR screenings uh, to this was our opening night event. And actually, some of the people that you see here uh, huddled together are somewhere here in the room. Um, uh, bonus points if you spot them. Um, <laughs> 10 points. Um, other than that, we have an annual conference day. We have markets where new projects get funding. We have a talent program running throughout the festival. Um, and online, we have our website where I think there's around 200 projects that you can look back to um, today. And projects, for instance, one of the things I'm most proud of that we ever did was a collaboration with MIT uh, called Moments of Innovation. Um, it's slightly dated. Um, up until 2012, I think, but it's totally worth it to uh, go through it. Um, and I just want to end it with a few final words as we're um, about to celebrate our 10-year anniversary. I think when we started the program, there was a lot of skepsis around whether the internet was actually a medium that could be suitable for art or not. Um, 
And I think 10 years later, um, we got to the point where I love Zeynep, uh, uh, view on, on the internet, yes, it's good and bad. And I think basically this goes for VR as well, right? Um, so where we are now, interactive documentary uh, is growing up. Some people know that I always use cats in my... <laughs> um, but I would say starting from t 10 years ago where there was a few people here and there around the world doing interactive documentary and stuff that was so hard to define, I think uh, amongst other thanks to MIT Open Doc Lab and some of the other organizations that were bringing people together, we now have a small ecosystem. Yet at the same time, I think, as the web has grown up, we're also starting to realize <laughs> that the world that we inhabit has become digitized to an extent that maybe isn't always great. Um, and we're sort of having this sort of next wave of technological breakthroughs with VR sort of being, I think, the gateway drug um, to a lot of other things. Um, and I want to close with uh, a quote by Jonathan Harris, one of my favorite artists in this space, um, who said a couple of years ago, we speak a new and powerful language capable of saying things no other language can say, but few have realized this, and even, few, even fewer have found what to say. I think that's the case for interactive documentary, but uh, for VR, we're, we're not even towards a full language yet. And that's why um, we're launching something new this year, which is called the Immersive Nonfiction Network which is um, a program where we want to develop pilot projects, want to do uh, audience research and organize events and bring different people together. So if you have a great idea for a weird VR project, do let me know. These are the deadlines and my contact info. Thank you very much. So my name is William Uricchio. I'm a professor here in Comparative Media Studies and principal investigator of the Open Doc Lab that's, that's uh, sponsoring this event. And to sort of segue into our first question, it, I'll, I'll pick up from Jonathan Harris, the, the Jonathan Harris quote you gave about the potentials for a new language. And I want to start with a, a sort of confusing moment in an old language. Those of you who have seen 360 video, especially attempts to tell stories with 360 video, may recognize Buster Keaton's dilemma here. Um, you're immersed in a world you're, it's convincing, it's, it's at least as convincing as the VR can make it, and all of a sudden you're somewhere else, like it or not. You're busy exploring something in this corner of, the, of this, this side of the, uh, the VR experience, and the director has decided it's time for you to go to the next scene. And this strikes me as such an, such an apt uh, expression of that dilemma. What language, what language should we be using? I think our default mode um, has often been to look back on the traditions we know from, you know, well-developed over the last hundred years with cinema and television in terms of how we do visual storytelling. But I think certainly in 360 um, uh, VR, but also to some extent beyond that, we're kind of we're kind of fumbling our way through that old vocabulary into a new one. So I, I guess with that, it would be maybe a, a good question to start with is. What kind of new vocabularies? What kind of what kind of new techniques um, are, are we are we at an impasse with what we're using, and or should we be looking for new kinds of ways of telling nonfiction stories? Um, I mean, Nona, you've done it quite well with what you're doing. Your soundtracks tend to really hold things together, um, and the visuals make sense accordingly. But what's your sense of this? Where do we what do we need to be thinking about in terms of structure for story in this space? Any of you? Yeah. Well, there's the technological issue of nausea, right? <laughs> that's a, no, that's a serious issue in this space, right? It's, a, it's a unique to this medium, and we have to address um, that as part of the construction of our pieces. So I know that Ben Solomon, who made that really nice piece of displaced, was saying that um, there's one shot where people are on a boat moving or they're on the back of a truck moving, and he said, you know, 70% of the people I, tell me it's their favorite shot, and another 30% say it made them so nauseous they had to rip the goggles off. So that issue of knowing that where your eyes feel like you're moving but your body is not moving, that disconnect can be really problematic for a part of the audience. And I don't know how we're gonna solve that. I mean, I tend to lock the camera off. I tend to be very conservative. I tend to be not one. I let people move with their bodies. That's one of the reasons why I like the body embodied stuff, because then the body and the camera are, which is your eyes, are connected. 
I do that uh, uh, in maybe a conservative way because some people will say moving the camera is fine. Um, that is something which I think we're going to find out. I mean, I've heard some very weird possibilities that actually there's like a, a an inner ear. I don't know what exactly they're doing, but they're like putting, pressing, like pushing like air into the inner ear so that it creates a pressure system to make you feel like you're moving when the camera's moving. But like that's a technological solution, and I think that we as artists should be coming up with some storytelling solutions first. Yeah, I think for us as journalists, you know, the thing that we're we're struggling with is how do you do, um, especially investigative journalism in this space. How do you how do you actually transmit real information? We would call journalism in this space that actually you can you can actually absorb without reverting to you know, a ton of voiceover, which we will use some of, but you know, ultimately I feel like we're in the sort of beta phase for what we're gonna do for journalistic VR in our case. Um, and I think 8i and some of the experiences that I've had since actually could transport us in a way that is frameless that will help us rethink then how we can tell stories. So I feel like the work that we're doing is almost, you know, I'm speaking just on Frontline's behalf because we've now done four or five big projects. I think we're getting closer and closer to understanding how you can get information in. And I think the other thing, and I've seen it in some of the work that you guys have done, is how do you take then 2D images? So a lot of the world that we live in is telling stories that have existed already. So if you're telling, if you're telling a story about you know Storm Sandy, for example, because we're doing a VR experience about living through a storm, then how do you take these archival images that are still in 2D, that are still captured in 2D, that are real, that you want to give a real sense of the actual incident itself? How do you combine 2D in a 3D environment, or do we have to? Right, so when you're telling a story that actually happened and it's not captured in 360 or in VR, what do you do as a storyteller? These are the biggest challenges we have as documentarians in a space where we want to tell real stories or we want to transmit you know, deep information. And, and frankly, at Frontline, we're used to it. So we just had a, a conversation today about the meaning of this work being more than just a really cool environment, at least for Frontline, right? So how do you, it's not to be experimental visually for much, us as much as it is, how do we take you inside a story in a deeper way so you feel like you're there more and then you're impacted more? Challenging. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just pick up on that as well, actually. Um, in terms of the challenges, I think one of the things that we've been learning as we've been working with, um, especially with big broadcasters, is that, um, is that a lot of the conversation is quite understandably coming from a very familiar language of, of television and film. And um, I think the way that we work is sort of, I mean, we, un, we, we, we also come from that tradition, but we all are trying to kind of bridge the gap to um, understand more about game design and, um, and kind of starting from a perspective of, okay, my story exists in the body of the user and what are they doing in this story that actually tells the narrative? And I'm um, conveying that to a <laughs> ETV commissioner <laughs> is like, it's, it's been, um, it's an interesting conversation. You know, they, they automatically, the question is always, what, but what does it look like? And we go, but no, you want, we want people to do this. And they're like, yeah, but what, when they do that, what does it look like? So, you know, I think those kinds of conversations are really, they are a real challenge, and it's, a, it's everyone kind of figuring it all out together, I suppose, yeah. Can I just push the inter-institutional thing a bit? I mean, especially for organizations that are large legacy organizations, have not done much VR, are interested in it because it's cool or because it's hot or because they need to do it because everyone else is doing it. Um, that's sort of maybe a top-down incentive. Bottom-up, you've got makers who have a project that can really benefit from this, that, that needs VR in a way that a, a, a flat, a, a 2D or maybe a linear is not gonna do the trick. Those two pressure points sometimes don't align. In fact, I'm willing to bet they often don't align in some organizations. Um, any better ways to make those reconcile or? I think like at Frontline, we always ask, should this story be in VR actually? So we're not just doing VR for VR's sake. 
Like we're actually doing it because we think it could tell a better story. Or we're working with Nani because we can see that she'll take us to the next level when it comes to storytelling. So because we have Frontline already, we're doing linear film. They're, they do really well, even digitally. These films do great. So, you know, it's being disciplined, actually, about making sure when we're making a decision that it's a righteous, creative, and journalistic decision. So it takes discipline, and I am a commissioner, right? So it does take discipline for somebody like me to say, no, 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 we're not going to just do the cool thing that I know is going to you know, get a million people to see it. It's just like, what does it mean? Should it be VR even? I don't think every story is, is meant to be told in this space, you know, frankly. I think it's really encouraging, though, to see um, to see organisations <laughs> like that. I mean, like like you guys and like the BBC that we work with um, are willing to take a kind of a gamble in a way, especially at this stage when no one really knows how it's going to go. No one really knows how to distribute it. Um, the work that we make for um, for you know Oculus Rift. I mean, how many people have their hands on a CV1 right now? Not, not but the, but the, the thing that's pretty ticking whatever time bomb or whatever that's I think is going to be super, super interesting is when the Morpheus hits in October. Because if you've got 40 million plus users who've got a PlayStation and they can plug in their Oculus Rift for 300 bucks, now we're, sorry, Oculus Rift, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, mistake, Morpheus, the Sony Morpheus for $300. So if you've got an audience you know, worldwide of 40 million in which a 300 million, sorry, $300, God, I'm tired. <laughs> I feel like I keep my story. A three hundred dollar headset can get plugged into the PlayStation VR. Well, that's a major, major distribution pipeline. So what then for story? And Sony's a little, you know, um, you know, and Valve has Steam, and Steam is pretty good about letting you upload, and and um, Oculus has the Share, uh, Oculus Share, which lets you upload stuff. And Sony is making a sign a rather. They're, they even said, let's have your lawyer on the first phone call because the becoming a developer for Sony is such a hugely layered, onerous thing. So they need the content. I, I don't really know what's going to happen, but I can tell you for somebody like me who's saying, wow, I'm going to have access to that kind of distribution for the, you know, you know, maybe even bigger than some of the um, broadcasters I worked with, right? Um, that's pretty massive. But this is really, I mean, this is history repeating itself for the umpteenth time. Yeah. The beginning of every medium has all these format uh, di dilemmas. Every company is trying to hold on to its proprietary format and therefore its distribution, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they construct their own distribution bottlenecks. And I wonder, I mean, on the one hand, so we were dazzled at festivals with all this great stuff, and then you go out and you buy something and it doesn't actually work with, um, the things you thought were really cool, or you're really limited. Is that is there going to be wisdom this time round on the parts of the corporations, or is this going to be driven by a user revolt? Well, the, the I think. <laughs> Yeah, you should no, talk. No, no, really no, no, no. <laughs> I think young people are going to drive this, frankly. Like, I was thinking, you know, during the year I was an open doc lab fellow, um, my child, my boy, was seven and a half or eight. And you remember the kind of profound conversations I was having with my children about their expectation from media. So they're, certainly their expectation is that it's an immersive environment, first and foremost. They can touch it and feel it, and they can really be in their environment. So I do think think that this is going to happen to us, frankly, that people who are experienced PlayStation, who are gamers already, they're going to be driving the expectation for the work that we do to some degree. And I think the fact, and you should weigh in on this too, that Facebook and YouTube and Google are making such a play for the space, even in a 360 sense right now, with native players that we're publishing in. And I think Carla Boras is here today. She runs VR for us with me. And you know we're really looking at these new environments to publish natively in because that's where we reach the, the most number of people. So I, I don't know if it's going to repeat itself. I just think that there's a huge opportunity here. I, th I think it's repeating itself. Um, I mean, there's, there's, it's which part of history is it repeating? But I mm. think the difference, um, if I look 10 years ago when sort of this happened around web and, and art I think there was the same thing broadcasters need to like deal with this thing called the internet and get to the young people and um, I think the great thing was that the internet was an open platform mm -hmm. even though there was proprietary stuff like flash but there was the internet and it was a place where everybody basically was very 
could, could cheaply uh, uh, play around and distribute to everybody. And the, 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 the great thing um, now is that there's actually companies needing to sell devices. So there's money, there's a hype, there's like big, big money going into this. That's why, that's the good news. The bad news is there is no web VR or some people yeah. are working on it, but it's I not got a, I got an email there yesterday. yet. I got I an email Sorry, yesterday. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brian. I think it will come. I think we really need it, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> it. It will come. No, it, I think it's, it's um, right now it's, it's, it's really sort of, I mean, it's the good and the bad of it, of it right? We, some in the world keep trying to bottle the genie, stuff it back in, and yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very good point. Race is another, I mean, it's a tangentially related point, but it's about ethics in this, that um, there are a whole lot of ethical issues. The one that gets talked about a lot is the, is the affect. I mean, this is an affective medium, or at least is alleged to be. One could argue that literature and film are also quite affective, um, but, there are, there are, and we'll talk about this tomorrow with, uh, with some neuroscientists, that this is processed in a slightly different way and may have different implications on that score. We know that eye tracking is the next big thing, and those eye tracks are going to be doing more than helping us navigate and mitigating nausea. What happens to that data? I mean, Facebook's interest in this is not, is not just about trying to capture a new market for entertainment. Um, Thoughts on the ethical stance of things? Is this a place where we need, where, how can we foster more uh, attention to this or more debate or sharper sense of what's happening? I think that's, you know, that's a key part of the grant that the Knight Foundation gave to, uh, jointly to Emblematic and Frontline was to try to come up with some ethical best practices through this exploration of making content to try to at least raise the questions and make sure that they're front and center that we're, we're trying to you know, wrangle with these and and dig deeper into what these issues are. Um, you know, I faced a lot of these, particularly when I started out, um, because I was recreating scenes, right? So, I mean, I literally had colleagues pointing their fingers in, at me, going, you can't do this, this will never work, this isn't journalism, that's a game platform, or, you know, games aren't journalism. I mean, it was really, I took a lot of criticism when I began this process. Um, and I still get a, questioned a lot about whether I'm ethically uh, trying to address the issues. But I think uh, the best we can do is, is make sure that we um, raise the questions and indicate that when we're making this work at this point that we aren't ignoring um, um, the kind of pr principles that we have utilized previously uh, in print and broadcast and documentary um, that have informed our approach to work and our sensitivities to the individuals whose stories we're trying to portray of our grant, which I think is cool because it's also a maker grant, so we're making three big projects and we're just, we're just actually for the first time started really making the first project um, this week. And I think out of that, we're gonna be asking these really tough questions of each other. And of course, we come much more from the traditional, but so does Nani, so I think it's gonna raise a lot of these questions. Then we have to publish some stuff that you'll hopefully help us edit. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of questions, I mean, this we're talking about a fairly interactive medium. It, the floor is open for questions, so if you have any, come forward. Um, and meanwhile, another question on my part is simply, um, and this certainly happens a lot in the exhibition space, the, the festival space of VR, but how do we, you know, it's a very individual medium, cloistered off from the world in our little box. I guess you could argue that reading was the same way. Um, and yet, the cinematic or the visual part of it, and maybe even the affective part, kind of encourages us to want to be with other people. They're usually around us. They're, the noise is coming through the headsets in most festival settings. Um, and I know that this latest iteration of The Enemy that will be shown here actually has, I think you can see other, I haven't seen it, but I think other figures are in it. Oh, well, okay, yet to be seen. If you have a teenage kid, and or, you know, particular boy, I mean, if you don't think you aren't hearing their friends in the, coming out of their bedroom from their TF2 play, that they're not screaming at each other and you can't hear the other kids coming through the, into your house. I mean, uh, you know, the story I always I mean, tell is that my, my son was in the living room with his laptop open on his lap, and my daughter was in my, her garage, my garage office. My daughter walked into the living room, my son looked up from the laptop, and went, why'd you leave? 
but she just walked in the room, and what he meant was, why'd you leave the Minecraft server we were playing on together, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so shared, ex shared experiences may not be necessarily sitting next to each other with the stuff on. Shared experiences, the places that we go together and, and virtual spaces. Will classrooms come together to, um, I mean, when I did virtual, the virtual Guantanamo Bay prison in, in Second Life, that was a very interesting, for me, uh, moment where I would show up at our virtual build and there'd be classrooms from Canada coming to expect the virtual Gitmo because they couldn't actually look at the real one, right? So, um, and there, you know, people I didn't know and it would be, would be coming in all the time. So um, that kind of experience, I think it's gonna end up being more common. Um, but in, 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 as we start to be able to scan our world like you guys are in the field is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, as we're able to bring people in and, and do this very interesting volumetric capture, um, the embodied, you know, right now when you jump at the movies, it's going to be a different kind of jumping. And you'll be jumping with your friends, but just maybe not sitting next to each other. I, I would agree. I think that's definitely where we're going. But I would actually question whether, um, you know, you say that um, when you're in a festival environment, you actually do want to kind of be in the headset and share your experience. I. I mean, personally, I don't, you know? <laughs> Like, I actually think we shouldn't be scared of the fact that it is an individual thing. And um, sometimes that's, it's a blessed relief, you know? You get in there and you're, oh, you know, like, I don't have to, to we, we're, I think it, it says something to the way that we um, are kind of trained to communicate these days that everything is collective, right? And we kind of expect that to be the way that things should be. But, I mean, just speaking personally, I think that, um, there is some element of, of me that goes, ah, oh, I actually don't have to do that while I'm here. So I, I think we should embrace that. It's interesting how we talk about the definition of what VR is, even though it's, it's not defined yet. And I yeah. think let's embrace the fact that it's still undefined in that sense, because what you're describing is some of my favorite VR experiences. What you're describing is some of the little VR uh, multi-user things that I've seen so far that really excite me. They're both, I don't know if it's VR, I don't care. Like it's, it's both immersive art or immersive experiences, solitary and non-solitary. Mm. Yeah. You can have interactive theater and non-interactive theater. Cake and eat it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you all. Is this on? Testing, okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you all, this is a, a great panel. My name is Dan Roy, I'm a CMS alum. Hi, William. Um, I love actually your last comment about the VR is undefined because I agree. In five years, we won't have a conference on VR. We'll have a conference on all of the subsets and you know, the, the experience of Google Cardboard versus you know, the Vive is so completely different, opposite ends of the spectrum. One is seated and you have to hold your hands to your face. The other, you're moving around the room. Some of you talked about inclusivity, there's a tension between, you know, the reach of the Google Cardboard or PlayStation 4 versus some of these experiences that may be more immersive or may track more aspects of your body in the space, but maybe enable us to do more with that medium. How do you balance the tension between exploring the potential of the medium that you're interested in with the mandate of the organization you come from to reach whatever your target audience is. Thank you. Can I, I, I think it's, it's, if we ask that question to a medium like print, you would say there's really expensive pop-up books being made or there's really expensive coffee table books that you really devote your entire attention to and there's newspapers and there's comics and there's short stories and there's poetry. Like, I think VR can be all those things. Um, if you're making something for the Vive, it's like making an experience for, like, like first of all, the Vive asks of people to devote a room to thing. It's like buying an entire physical pool table and putting it in your house. The experience no, no, must be really, sure. really special to, to, like, <laughs> uh, um, to live up to that. Uh, for the cardboard, I think we're totally looking more at social experiences. We're totally looking at quick experiences, or it's a much more versatile medium, just like a newspaper is much more versatile. But it does yield two radically different VR experiences. One is good yep. for 360 video, and one one has incredible different set of, of affordances. So I think if, if one thinks just, that it's like having a TV in your home. It doesn't really require too much more space. You can have you can just have a your TV room right now is very easily convertible to a, a, 
a vibe space. You don't not need a huge amount of room to walk around. So, um, just to say. Maybe, maybe my house is too small. But. No, <laughs> your, your house is big enough. You just have to kick the baby's crib, yeah, you know, out of the, out, into the hallway for a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I mean, for Frontline and public television, I think that one of the most important things is that we, we do survive. So one of the parts of surviving is being brave and looking at new story form. I really do believe, and that's not just VR, that's also across interactive storytelling and also just natively publishing on other platforms. And I think that's part of our mandate is to continue to try to do really high quality work. As it pertains to VR, I was really excited by the fact that you can look at how this can be more widely available, even if the experience isn't as amazing as Vibe and, and some of the really incredible VR experiences I've had. But just to give people a cinematic 360 experience is an entryway into understanding this space that I think is important. And then people have more access to it. So at Frontline, because we are public television and we're public media, we have to make this available so people can access it so it's available to the public. And I know the barrier is gonna become much, much, much less expensive even still for the, for the more immersive experience. So we're doing both and all, frankly. Yeah, I think from an indie producer's point of view, again, we ha we're in the same position. We get asked, we kind of pitch in at the, at the highest quality we want, and then um, we often having to do things like version the work for, um, for a broader distribution platform. Hi, um, thanks for a great panel. I'm Phil Guerra, I recently graduated from MIT Sloan. Um, I had this weird uh, moment at the Tribeca Film Festival's VR exhibit where basically I was handed a menu of VR items to look from, and they were all um, stories of human suffering in some way, and I, I kind of felt weird just like being like, okay, I'm gonna pick this one out of famine. Um, so I'm wondering you know, what, what you guys make of this kind of trend that seems to have captured early VR, th uh, this focus on human suffering, um, and, and despair, and uh, yeah, I, I wonder what you make of it, and I wonder, um, you know, why that's become so popular, and if, if um, that same kind of power for suffering can be used in, in other ways. I think, I think a lot of people gravitated to the concept that virtual reality does offer um, a connection uh, that, that creates empathy in the audience, and um, I think, um, there's been certainly a perception that the audience has been dis become disconnected, has become, um, you know, their senses dulled to important stories around the world that for some reason they've been overloaded with images and therefore they stopped caring about their world. So I think that people who did care and do care really gravitated to the fact that maybe they could create an empathy in their audience that could help um, bring focus and as I always say, um, with younger audiences, in particular to make sure they um, are uh, informed global citizens about their world. So it's not as if the news organizations don't always approach these issues, and perhaps they seem focused because there's only, you can't find the comic section in, in VR very yet. Um, and right now it's mostly focused on the, um, the stories that are, um, you know, would be more of the front page stories in a way, you know. Um, yet, I think that that, that the approach is, you know, it, it does seem like, are we gonna see another refugee story, right? And we're getting that, that overload, which we were talking about before, and yet, when you go in and you actually put the goggles on and you experience those stories, you go, it's really not just another story. It is as important as the last one. Um, <coughs> So I think that's the balance. Like, how do you make sure that we have a comic section, but make sure we continue to be able to make the really important stories that touch people? Maybe to add to that, I think, I think at this point we don't really distinguish between journalism and documentary and art. <laughs> and I think if I look at film, um, I mean, that very same comment can be made of uh, the documentary film world where and I've always found that slightly awkward working for a film festival where everybody would like l l line up to see that amazing film about other people suffering and then have beers afterwards and go dancing. And I think there is a 
deeply strange thing happening there, and it deals with physical uh, or like the, the, the um, it's strange that we need media to have like stories from other people suffering, and we're completely disconnected from that. Uh, and there's this sort of catch-22 where like it gives us access to that and makes us feel something, and at the same time we're just observers. And I think in VR, same thing. We're just observers, and sometimes even worse so, uh, because when the medium becomes interactive, it's actually asking me to do something and to partake in that story somehow. And I think it's when it's done right, it's, it's some, like, it, it can be incredibly visceral, like uh, the enemy uh, for me, like made me feel what it is to be a tall white dude standing in front of a tiny little Palestinian guy who's going through immeasurable suffering that I can never even understand. And I actually felt how, I, how distant I was from him in a way that a film would never do. A film I would blame the, the, the filmmaker for not doing, making the right film. Here I was like, actually I'm standing there and I'm actually not caring so much. Like, why am I not, why am I walking around this space instead of listening to him? Um, I think the other thing is I, what I really hope and what I've always been doing with Doklab is look for interactive stories that where the thing that the user brings makes the story and I think looking at suffering is, is not a great thing to bring, uh, but like diving deep into yourself or like exploring how mundanely or like how intensely boring your life is can be an incredibly dramatic experience if like in an interactive piece you do that right. Like that question that the, the robot asks you all sorts of questions, that's like really everyday life stuff, but really intense. And I would love to see more of that um, in VR. And yet many. I would suggest to you, I mean, investigative storytelling is no, no, but that's crucial. Like, it's crucial. Totally, totally. But that's why I'm saying, like, that's, there, there's a part journalism, and there's a part, like, documentary and art, and just like we have poetic documentaries that show us the beauty of a landscape. But the, but the part right, about I mean, VR... Right. I was, I was going to say, actually, because this question, the very same question came up at another conference a couple of days ago where somebody said, are we at risk for stereotyping even in this environment? So they took it to another level. And um, I said, well, for Frontline, you know, we have this saying, we're the trouble with. So it's sort of what we do, right? Like, we, we actually unpack investigative stories. So our hope is we're not just bringing you human suffering, but we're actually investigating it. So at the end, you, f you don't feel as hopeless. That's the whole point to Frontline, right? And that I just, we haven't cracked it yet in VR, right? It's more immersive than our films are, but I just have to believe that we're gonna be able to crack this code so you don't feel as hopeless and sort of depressed after, or, or um, like you said, maybe you even feel distant from it and like you don't care and you don't know why you don't care. So I think it's a great question. I mean, I think there's an underlying, one, one of the great things with VR done well is that um, there's a tension between that feeling of being there where you, you know, as you just said, you're there, you're, you're empathetic in ways that you probably could distance yourself from with other media that you're more familiar with, and at the same time, you're, you're watching, There's, you're, you're, a, you're a voyeur, there's nothing you can do. And, uh, and to find a way to sort of exploit that tension, to, to direct that tension into I mean, action right. would be really that's remarkable. That's what the enemy does in a way. And the, yeah, the enemy, I have to say, of, of um, yeah, don't miss it. If you haven't signed up, uh, don't miss it. It really is, I haven't seen this version, but. That, I yeah. think that question as a storyteller always is an issue because you get to walk away at the end of the day. Yeah. And that is something which, if you're, you know, if you're sensitive to that issue, it carries through your work from beginning to end. Hi, uh, hi there. Uh, so I'm Amy Sterling. I'm the director of iWire. It's a brain mapping game, crowdsourced neuroscience, and I'm a huge fan of VR. And to kind of springboard off that last question, I think virtual reality has this huge, tremendous potential for wonder and awe, right? Like you can see things that you could never otherwise experience. And as someone who works in science and technology, I'm always looking for more VR experiences that say tell the, the history of invention or, you know, the evolution of neuroscientific discoveries. You know, you could be in Isaac Newton's lab and so I would just love to hear you guys' thoughts on kind of the, the future of, you know, telling stories of discovery and maybe even data visualization or that, that realm of VR. 
just got asked by a friend who's a quantum physicist uh, to help visualize a, a 12 dimension project that they're working on. <laughs> I'm like, please, let me, please, let me get a crack at that. Like, well, how amazing fun will that be? So um, I agree, I think it's really, really interesting because they kind of talk about their lab in this sort of non, you know, normal way. And I, you know, can barely wrap my head, you know, I don't think I can wrap my head around it. I even think that would be a lie if I can say barely. But the idea of getting to think about VR as a place that we can start to visualize things that are, you know, otherwise unimaginable, literally, to most of the world is really exciting. I think you're absolutely right. Um, microscopically, we're, we're working with a, um, a scientist uh, who turned artist in, um, Switzerland, who does uh, microscopic, uh, you know, microelectron imagery of mites, and he makes these incredibly beautiful images of the world of the mite. And um, you know, I keep laughing. My poor team keeps saying, "What do you mean you want to make a love story about mites?" But like, you know, uh, you know, that's it, right? We can do things like that that understand, live in their world in a way that is so beautiful and different, and again, unimaginable. And I think that's one of the really exciting parts of VR. People on our team, Carla is always saying, like, if she was a kid today learning science, like how totally amazing it would be if people could put their, their minds to how we could teach with this form, which I know you have someone speaking about tomorrow, which I think is one of the most amazing tools. And the other work that's really impressive is work that's being done at POV, um, and they do a lot of interactive storytelling, but some of their most dramatic work has been in data visualization which they've been starting to think about VR. And I just think some of the data visualizations they've done have so much potential in that 3D space as well, which is cool. There's a project in the exhibition tomorrow called LOVR by uh, Aaron Bradbury, yeah. which isn't technically scientific. Uh, it's inspired on neuro uh, um, scientific data on what happens when you fall in love. So it's basically you go, it's a data viz project where you go through, sort of fly through a timeline of a sort of slow down the, the moment when somebody falls in love at first sight. Um, and you should check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name's Andre. I study um, synesthesia as an inclusive praxis and in the context of what we were just talking about um, in um, in the context of learned helplessness and this sort of acquired apathy that um, if we're not very careful with it can be generated um, through uh, VR and I think it's this gap that we have where VR is more uh, more immersive than it is interactive. Um, and um, in the context of this, I'm wondering how would, uh, how, except from like the technology of interaction, um, how do we profile the processes of imagination in the VR space? <laughs> That's really deep. Guys. I can tell you what I think. Have many of you done tilt brush? Yep. Have any painted here with tilt brush? Very. Do you not feel like that's the process of imagination right there? We that that's a virtual reality painting program, right? One of the first ones where you paint in 3D, and uh, in colors, and you can throw snowflakes up and they fall on you. So I've had a lot of people demo that piece, and it kind of has astonished me the way that people engage with that piece, I have to take the headset off. And I've had you know, accountants come in and go, well, I'm really not creative. And then they can't believe what they can make. And it seems to me it gets to this basic thing. I don't know. I've, I've decided, I've decided, this is in my very anecdotal observation, that humans need to make. And it's no more and more evident than in this virtual reality p program. That, that is so wildly different, and I see people just don't want to stop making. So there is something there. I don't, I, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, want to go uh, much further than that since it's purely an anecdotal observation, but it's an anecdotal observation of hundreds and hundreds of people now. Um, uh, so if you can, go out and do tilt brush 
and you can start doing your own investigation. I think it's a great tool for that. Agreed? I'll just add to that. I think that, um, that your point about virtual reality being more immersive than interactive is probably true at the moment, but it's a, that's, it doesn't have to be like that. You know? And I think that is our job as artists and storytellers to kind of try, if we want to push it in that direction, it, we need to, to start from a place of interactivity, from starting from that, okay, what, what, what is, um, how do I tell my story through operation, you know, rather than how do I put it in front of your eyes so you can look around in it. Um, and I think once we start to think in that way, we will be starting to kind of get to that place where we're producing more engaging stories that have, um, that have doing as part of their very kind of bones, their DNA. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bester Graham, I'm a filmmaker, and I'm uh, taken by how often we're referring to this as an immersive medium, and we refer, and yet the examples that we're giving are essentially visual examples in terms of the immersion, knowing that actually audio is so much a part of immersion. So I'm curious about uh, how you're thinking about audio, sound, uh, the whole challenges that are we're faced with that uh, VR will be actually changing in terms of the space that we go into with it. And a very early piece that we did at the uh, lab of Mel Slater in Barcelona, who's one of the earliest virtual reality researchers who I did my first uh, uh, you know, big uh, wide five, those, those $50,000 goggles is where I worked. Um, and we did a piece where we put you in a body of a detainee in a stress position, um, where you first you saw this character in a stress position and then you had a virtual mirror and it mirrored every one of your movements. I was trying to look at what does it really mean all these Freedom of Information Act reports that a detainee would put in a stress position for hours on end. What, did that, what was that really like? What did that really mean beyond the words on a paper? But anyway, we did an interrogate, we used the interrogation log of al Qahtani, who the Bush administration said was tortured. So there's no doubt what had happened to the guy. And we use an actor to read the interrogation logs. And it was meant to come through another room. And they played it. I was not not yet, I was still in LA and I was flying to Barcelona and they were testing it on people and they played it right next to people. And I had done the audio recording with the idea it was gonna come through another room. So the audio was muffled and weird and wrong. And people were not having a very good connection to this case, right? Once we moved it back through the wall, then everybody, we, we, we had this experience, we, they were sitting upright in a chair with their arms behind their back like this, and we'd ask them what was the body like afterwards. Well, when the audio was right, they all reported being hunched over in a stress position. They took on the body of this guy in the mirror. Um, but without the audio working, they had none of that connection. So that was like immediately one of the first things I learned was that audio was the most crucial part of the experience. And we were just today at Frontline talking about our project, how do we solve the audio problem for something that we're filming? And the interesting thing from where I sit is a lot of our filmmakers have been stripping back their sound people as production budgets have been, shripping, have been shrinking. So we're yet again saying sound matters so much, and you know this, Bester, the, the production dollars have gone down for filmmaking. So then introducing again the fact of needing surround sound, really, right? But we know, too, that uh, even if the picture's bad, sound we'll watch sound. it if the sound right. is good. Right. This, this is a, a lesson from interactive documentary as well, that some of the best interactive documentaries actually started with the sound. Mm. And then all the interactive, visual, everything else uh, came after. I think you're showing notes on blindness here, aren't you? One of my favorite, favorite pieces that's been made recently is called Notes on Blindness. So if you can see that here, and it's basically somebody's uh, journey into, um, a, 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 it's literally somebody's recording his own journey becoming blind. And then they've done visuals on top, but in this way that the sound is so, his voice and his experience, it's just, it's extraordinary. It's funny to, I mean, a year ago, they showed me the, that project wasn't started as a VR piece, which I still love, just goes to show how early days this is. Mm. Like a year ago, they had like the, the, the demo of the iPad version, oh. and then were like, should we do this for VR? And now it's like one of the, Classics already, yeah, like an it's instant just a brilliant, classic. Wonderful, amazing piece. Hi, my name is Jacob Lowenstein. I'm a grad student at the Sloan School, and I run our student VR community here at MIT. Um, media historically, you hear of times when the vanguard of a new medium will talk about how, in the previous medium or the one before that, um, 
there was some experience, some story where you know, he or she wanted to feel it more, or perhaps that the narrative ran up against the boundaries of expression of that medium, you know. I could read Richard III, but I couldn't hear Richard III. And I'm curious, you know, as artists yourselves, if there are experiences from older media that you look to that sort of have inspired you in VR because they run up against the limitations of the medium through which they were expressed, or even relatedly, if there are ones you look to to learn, to learn from. For example, do you look to gaming to learn from how you know, previous artists have handled interactivity and elements such as that? Yeah, I mean, to answer that, half of my, my staff are from the games, the games world. We work with game developers, game artists, um, and we're learning as much from them as, as anything else. Um, I think that, you know, it's from, for our company's perspective, we do take a lot of inspiration from lots and lots of different places. I know, I mean, Oscar's an artist by training, so we talk a lot about painting, about sculpture, um, when we're doing our concept designs for our pieces. Um, or we've got our entire staff with, uh, who are from the games world. Um, and, you know, we, we've kind of named our company after Ziga Vertov, so <laughs> we kind of thought we kind of, we're not um, uh, adverse to experimentation in, in, in thought and form, I suppose. I think for the first time, Frontline's looking at interactive storytelling, mostly in the gaming space. I mean, and even with our first couple of projects, we were actually so just nascent stages that we would have to go around the room and understand the makers from secret location in this, in this um, situation. What do you do? Who are you? What do you make? And then they would show us their, their native computer language, and then we would learn from that. So we've had to really look at other story forms to understand how to start to tell stories in this way. And then, of course, good stories are good stories, right? And that's not anything new. You desperately, you know, um, always need to be absorbing good stories to think about how to construct good stories. So, um, and certainly all the visual stuff. I mean, there's, of course, lighting in games. It's lighting in films. How do you do lighting in VR? Um, and that's in itself a real challenge when people are moving around in a real-time way. Um, so trying to think about how did, how, did, how did big, I'll tell you what I like to look a lot at. I actually have these really beautiful old stage design books um, and um, from like all the way 50s through the 80s. And um, there's some beautiful stuff because now, yes, the stage used to be there. And yes, you're now you're in the middle of the stage. But the way that, that some of the approach was for that kind of space that you're in, I find it really inspiring. I think there's some, I think one of the things, if like how new media affect old media, like how, look at how photography affected painting. Like painting became a more exclusive, much more like abstract art came as a result of painting maybe even, uh, or abstract painting. Um, I think it's really interesting to look at like what was really niche back when old media were mainstream, like what was really happening on the fringe of opera at the time when opera was the main thing. Like what was happening in like experimental cinema at the time when cinema was the main thing? Well, maybe it still is. I don't know. But um, I think that's really interesting. Like I look a lot at performance art, at like uh, audio tour art, like really sort of art forms that use very basic uh, tools that we all have today, but um, that never reached the sort of mainstream level. And now through VR and the hype of VR, it's actually really interesting to see how. Some of those earlier masterpieces now can be reinvented. Hi, um, I'm Margot Ferris. I'm a graduate student with MIT, and I'm also a science correspondent with StoryBench, which is an under the hood um, look at digital storytelling and sort of the innovative things that are coming out of that right now. Um, and some things we like to ask are um, advice for incoming journalism students. So my question for you is, um, do you have any advice for um, students wanting to get into VR or this sort of immersive storytelling, whether they're in journalism or they're in game design or they're in um, programming? So we just had this great experience with NYU's um, journalism and film school where the, we ended up working with this team who did this great work out of Chernobyl. And actually, I think the best advice I could give is learn the technology, learn how to use the cameras, learn how to actually edit and understand it enough because for someone like me to work with students is completely exciting if you're bringing to, to us 
skills that, you know, are not natively cooked into front lines producing core at this point, right? So if you come through the door really with some skills that we don't have, you will be welcome, trust me. <laughs> and so I would, I would give some very specific answers to that question, which is, I've got audio, um, which is that, um, you know, they should learn uh, a stitching software. For, for, they want to do 360 video cinematic VR. They want to learn um, some crucial, they want to do stitching, some editing in Premiere. Um, there's things like Autopano that can help. Uh, the Foundry is about to release a tool that auto stitches. Um, so these are some very specific, um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, my brain is falling on the audio tool. I can't believe it. Uh, oh well. So it's pretty easy to find with 360 video. So there's, there's sort of four key things you really need to know for 360 video. It's, it's going to be, um, you know, your stitching, um, your premiere editing, uh, your audio tool, and then think about how do you bring that into a game engine. And you have some compositing, which also Foundry makes another tool called Nuke. And what the what the what the auto, what the um, compositing does is when you've got two cameras shooting and there's some sort of overlap maybe or an underlap and you've got to do something about Fixing that, you use a tool called Nuke to, to kind of uh, manipulate the digital information to kind of basically put a Band-Aid on the, in a very pretty way on the, on the problem where the shooting is. When you go into kinematic VR, a tool that's a little bit different and can be more complex, um, then you get into tools like Maya, Motion Builder, certainly the, all of these game engine helps, Unity, Unreal. Sorry, I like to give this list for people so it's not so mysterious. Um, Unity and Unreal are the two game engines that you use. Uh, and um, um, I mean, honestly, if you can get a little Maya and a little Unreal under your belt, you can go really far with um, uh, kinematic VR. And then some of the scanning stuff. What do you guys use? What do you, can you tell your tools? iPad and a structure sensor. And they are, you can buy those for $600. Yeah, they're, they're very affordable. So my advice to, would be, just do it. You know, um, it's kind of a free for all at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> Lots of people absolutely. can make the barriers to entry are low, and um, and if you get out there and make something, you're an expert. You know. <laughs> no, it's interesting because. Um, what was this song? Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. there we go. Uh, no, it's interesting because you know it's a very collaborative field. You mentioned you've worked with um, people in other disciplines, um, but so it's interesting with um, you know students coming into this for the first time, what they can learn, like the um, software you were mentioning, but then also how um, you know some of these headsets cost hundreds of dollars, so like you know getting access to that as well. So, um, do you have any thoughts on that? How can, can I add one more thing that I've given that list of tools? Yeah, sure. But I always tell people the first thing place to start. It's just to close your eyes and fill your body in the space before you make the story. And you, because that's more like what VR is like. Your body's in the space, so what does it feel like? And I think that's a really, before you begin writing your story or thinking about your story, what does it mean to be in the middle of it? Sorry, please finish your question. How do you get access to the tools? I know that's, a lot of the software is great. I mean, Unity totally helped create this whole VR wave because they, I used a free game engine software for a long time, and I, I am so grateful to my YouTube C Sharp teachers. So I learned my coding on, on, on mostly on YouTube, um, from YouTube. Um, so that part's a pretty easy thing. It's true getting the headsets is a little bit harder, but um, here's the interesting thing: is a, you'd be surprised. Like um, a lot of the headset manufacturers made some first versions, and they made a lot of those first versions, and they're not as good as the latest versions, and there's going to be a lot of people getting rid of the older headsets, I guarantee you, and that's going to be a lot cheaper for people to have access to them, so I bet they can start looking in a marketplace like that. I was actually surprised at the NYU students and how low their budget was. We can share with you, you know, like a short list of the equipment that they had because they were able to construct something pretty affordably, and they talked the faculty into buying it. So get some people on your side, you know, in positions of power to buy stuff. And it's usually, I mean, they really gave us a lower budget for what they bought as the entry point, you know, and that's just to start experimenting. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Gabriella Arp, and I'm actually kind of like on the next stage of her question. I'm graduating from UNC Chapel Hill and um, for my thesis project, I did a, a cinematic virtual reality film that I'm finishing in post-production now. And um, 
yeah, and so I had access to the camera through the school, and I had access to grants that let me travel to the location of the filming. And so now I'm kind of entering um, post-graduation life, which is obviously scary. Um, and mm -hmm. I guess my question is, beforehand, I was a freelance filmmaker. Um, if you see this industry as becoming something, like, uh, you know, for Katie, you started your own production company. Um, but how freelancers uh, fit into that scene? I think there's a big place for freelancers at the moment. Um, again, coming back to the, the space that everyone's kind of interested in this, few people are experimenting, I mean, more and more, but, but you know, you're going to be in a very good position if you've already made something to go out there and, and, you know, and get hired as a freelance um, 360 videographer, I would say. Um, we use... In, in, so in my workflow, we're not, we're not in 360 video, but we use a lot of freelancers from the game industry. So we're, you know, I would say that our structure is very similar to any other small um, media company. We, we kind of expand and contract as projects kind of come about. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in our world, the world of um, mostly linear documentary, as we're trying to expand in VR, you would be, well, you probably wouldn't be surprised, but we get thousands of pitches for linear films for, for our series, but we get very few um, really solid people coming through the door, like she was just saying, you know, that really know what they're doing and construct a story. So You'd be surprised how valuable your skills few. are right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't undersell your skills as you're graduating. It's kind of awesome that you decided to do this, considering this is the, the part of our world that's expanding at the moment. I mean, when, when, when the UN says that, it's telling the world that I think they got like a, I'm mean, gonna really misquote the number, but at least 30%, they went around with a, a VR film and they, they were trying to get people to donate to a cause and they'd show them the, 30, uh, the, the film and they had like a crazy 50% or something increase of donations after the VR film. So like all the NGOs are interested in, show, in having, making VR films and there are just not enough makers at this point out there. Um, that's just one market already. And then, Nani, on, on that note, when you were talking about kind of um, the different platforms that you're using, do you guys have any recommendations for gear? Because it's changing so rapidly, if I don't want to invest in gear, like where to rent gear from, or? There is the million dollar question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I know. We, we've, we've, we've compiled lists, and then we changed that list, and we put another list, and we've got another list. And so, you know, um, uh, if you want me to share with you our list and our, and our research, um, I'll tell you what we have together for um, uh, pros and cons. And um, really, we should put this Google up doc somewhere up, right? And then, and then, and then people can decide for themselves. But um, at least you'll have a kind of list of the, the take the research we've done and maybe make it util, uh, usable for, uh, and, and valuable for other people to make some decisions on their own. Anybody here have a recommendation on a camera, by the way? <laughs> Okay, yeah, it's, it's open. It's a really open field. Actually, it's hilarious because in the night grant, we're supposed to be buying gear together and we can't decide, so <laughs> we're still trying to figure it out. Because there's something coming in two weeks. In two weeks, in one two weeks, month, there's and NAB, and, and everybody and says something. Oh, and it's all God. easier, but so, is it as good anyway, right? So we're, we'll it's probably hard. just buy the bullet and buy a couple things that we think might be good enough and then see which one works best. But, I um, mean, you know, everybody's shooting with GoPro rigs right now, and they are good and terrible <laughs> um uh uh but um but um uh, as as we compiled this list that we've been putting together and um we should share it with you later thank you so i've got one last i don't see anyone else waiting so we'll, we'll uh but it, it's you know we've been talking a lot about vr and we've been looking and all of you make sort of um projects that stand on their own two feet maybe rainy you're the exception um because another way to look at this as is part of a media ensemble. There's more and more cross-platform work where each medium can kind of pull its weight, do what it does best, and VR obviously has a clear place in that, in that uh, constellation. Is that, I, I, certainly with organizations like the New York Times, that's the, the foreseeable future. VR can bring things to stories, it can bring attention to stories that might otherwise get it. Um, how do you see that evolving? S staying that way, more emphatically cross-media, more division of labor? I think that uh, 
that this type of storytelling will just grow as it pertains to you know current affairs or journalism. I think more and more people are passionate about it and doing it. I was actually with the New York Times, um, this guy named Sam Dolnick this week, and we were on a panel together. And he's great. He said they're, they're going to start a whole strand they're calling meditation VR. So to the point of just dis, you know desperate, depressing situations, they're trying to find a, a more meditative storytelling form. I think for places that are documentary series or broadcasters, we absolutely are going to keep expanding. But it'll be part of a whole swath of things that we do. It doesn't have to mean that linear film goes away or that writing goes away. And, and I just think it's another way of telling a story. And it can be very persuasive and very important, but it doesn't have to be the answer, the only answer. We have, we have a book on our shelf at home that uh, was published in 2005, and it's, where it said, it's on the history of the book. And the, and the, just, the dust jacket cover says, uh, boy, this book is more important than ever now that books are going away. Well, I, exactly, it's laughable. A decade later, that's the laughable claim, right? Books are not going away. But VR is, but VR is a fantastically interesting space you're creating. Okay, last question. Um, so we've talked a little bit about uh, the, the labor that's involved in this and uh, in traditional linear entertainment as uh, crew sizes have gotten smaller, you've gotten down to predators who now do two, three, four jobs in where there used to be five or six people, right? Um, what I'm hearing, though, in the creation of this, though, is that you actually are expanding staffs back out. Now, traditional entertainment is contracting as a business. You guys have yet to really establish a business model for VR. It doesn't really exist yet. How do we get past this? What are, you know, this is, the million dollar question or billion dollar question, really. How do the economics work? Economics, I'm not that sure. Would be the last question. I'm not sure if the answer. business models for other forms of documentary work <laughs> uh, as flawlessly oh, as. as <laughs> wonderful, thank you. But that's, I mean, it's it's funny, like, I mean, this is, this question I think is always like the, the question that we get at the festival, like what's the business model? And for 10 years of doing like interactive documentaries, like, but what is the business model? No, no, okay. We can't produce television right now because it doesn't cost too much money. And here we are and we wanna do passion projects and really great storytelling and art, yet it's going to be much more expensive to do it in this format than it is to do it in traditional. I can tell you how what my studio is surviving, which is we're doing the Vertov model, actually, and we're making some stuff for brands. <laughs> <laughs> Vertov made a few commercials in his day, didn't he? And that's what we're doing. We're, we're making some stuff for, for some major, um, major, major brands. Um, most of it's kind of fun because um, they sort of are like, you know, they haven't done this before, so you can kind of do whatever you want, and they're happy. Um, so it's a pretty fun time to be working for brands. I don't know how long that will last, but it's certainly <laughs> helping us. Um, uh, we have some major, major brands we're working with, and I don't know even know how that happened, but, we're, but it's happening, because we're an expert, right? I've been doing this. <laughs> That's, it's a joke, right? It's a joke. But I, because I've never made anything for brands before, but now I can make things for brands. Anyway, um, uh, uh, the deal is that's, it seems to me, I feel like the, what we're establishing in our company is very similar to the traditional models of the way that news media organizations have worked previously. We are making hard news, which we love. We are making some funny stuff. We're making some science stuff. We are making some branded, sponsored content to help fund. So that, to me, is the way that in the long term, in the big picture, and I know that isn't really answering your question, how I, as an individual, go out and make my project and raise the money to do it. I get that that's the pain point right now, and I've been there, as you know, 700 bucks for, for hunger. I had, wow, I had a big $35,000 to make Project Syria in six weeks and then take it to the World Economic Forum and show it to billionaires. Holy shit. So I feel your pain, but um, you know, we just made the pieces, and I think that um, you know, that's always the pain of an artist. So. You answered it's hustling, I think, is the answer, right? Well, the, maybe to add one more, I'm not sure if this is helpful, but we did a, a very sort of small research uh, attempt last year at looking at, like, how were interactive uh, documentary projects funded. This is sort of pre-VR, mm -hmm. but... Um, and, the th like, projects from the last, what was it, eight years or so? And out of that came that the, the average budget of a project was 200000 um, but if we looked at the distribution of the budgets per project, there was actually not a single project made for that budget. Like they were all made for like zero to 100, or they were made for like 300 and up. 
So that basically shows that either you work for nothing or, or you work with, like, you do it yourself or you work with a brand and you have a big, com a big budget. And, and I would encourage, just because we're public media, we actually have to keep our budgets conservative and we care about keeping things affordable. So we're not going to be able to do this very often if we can't get the controls down on the costs, right? I think it's really important to collaborate. So I would look at who you can collaborate with, because that's a lot of what we're doing right now, is we're going to other news organizations and other individuals who are making things, and we're putting teams together across multiple organizations, and we do it all the time, and it has taken our costs down dramatically. So universities or other, or other journalism entities or whatever you're really interested in um, editorially, you know, look to see how you can partner, because then it can get your entry in, but then also take your costs down. But we absolutely have to do this, or this is not, this is almost a folly for public media. Because very specifically, like, this is, this is a place where there's a lot of innovation, and the innovative tools are going to need the content to showcase them. For example, we're, we're, we're in the middle of, dis we're getting towards the end of a really beautiful discussions with 8i, which just raised millions of dollars, they're about to do their B raise, is, is Series B, so they're getting a lot of money. Um, we don't have that kind of money, you know, because we're still a content maker. Um, but they're going to offer us um, a stage and support, and um, we're going to work on a journalism platform together, which is super exciting. So here's a company that they need somebody to showcase their um, tool set, um, and um, you know, but you know, I have to tell you, there are other the other companies like them, a couple other companies out there for sure. But these guys are a few blocks away from me. And so they care about journalism, right. which is really unusual for one of these big companies, one of these big tech companies to actually say journalism is their priority or one of their priorities. For us, was completely an extraordinary experience. And let me tell you, we've had a lot of phone calls where it's clear that that's not the company's real priority. So finding those those partners. And But you're, I feel like you're here at a place where there's such cool incubation happening. I would think that this would be one place where you'd find people making the kind of tools to help you yeah. that, that need yeah, you to showcase their tools. Yeah, actually, so, the project that we just did at Tribeca was a, a research collaboration with the BBC and with a bunch of universities. So they actually developed the audio tools that we, we ended up using. And they, had, they you know, that brought the cost of the whole project right down because we had the whole soundscape already made for us. Um, so yeah, it's, I think collaboration is, is the way to go. It's affordable and it, it's an audience builder. It's a great way to bring people to a story that might not otherwise have found it. So it's just a win, win, win. Hey, with that, I'd like to thank our panel and uh, you guys as well. And hope to see a lot of you over the next two days. Thanks. <laughs>